talk. And welcome to our session for this month. Um, we are glad to have you and we thank you for creating time for this session. And we hope we have some interactive uh, discussions this afternoon. Um, we will have the agenda up. Uh, but uh, I just want to say that the spotlight for today may not come on. Uh, we got a message at the end, but we have some interactive but the topic today is hospital cleaning and disinfection. If you remember last month we had wash, so it's like moving into each other. Now we are becoming more specific, uh, and uh, we have two great presenters, two great facilitators to take us through this. Uh, Anna Bodran from Cape Town is going to take us with overview. Of the health facility environmental cleaning. Uh, I know we are all experts, but we want to have it from the experts and uh, subsequently we'll have the applicable best practices in health environmental contamination. That's more hospital based. So, those are the two topics for today. The spotlight on the University of Benin, I'm not sure if she comes on. Those are some questions that are answers and discussions. So we go through the agenda. Our usual uh, home housekeeping, we try to name our phones, our laptops, so that we can call us when you put up your hands. If you want to talk, put up your hands and then you put your questions in the chat box. And at the end, we are going to use the chat box to give us the feedback so that we can continue to improve. So, well, it's, uh, we'll go straight to the overview, like I said, of the facility environmental clinic by Mrs. Anna Bokan. And then subsequently, we will have Dr. Chioma Oswa to take us through applicable best practices in the environmental contamination. So you note all your questions and the issues for comments, for discussions, and then we will have feedback uh, and then announcement for next month. That is the big umbrella. And on that note, I don't know if um, Simra, we have Simra from India joining us. Uh, and we have Anna presenting from South Africa, but that's still Africa. I don't know if there's any other comments here. Uh, so that Simran will just say hello to us briefly before we go to the discussion. Simran, do you want to say a word or two? Are you alone? Anybody with you? Hi, everyone. Hope and run the slide. And I'm really happy to see you all. And I'm hoping that it will be a great session as always. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I guess we have uh, people from most of the African countries, so we are happy to share your experiences, your, your contributions and comments so that we can learn from each other. Uh, on that note, I want to introduce our first facilitator uh, in the person of Mrs. Anna Water. She is our executive manager, Pension Control African Network. Actually, they are the big umbrella in Africa, and the Nigerian Society for Pension Control is one of the societies that is collaborating with them. She is the executive manager. She is a nurse by profession, a graduate nurse, an educationist, special interest in hospital training and disinfection. Um, and she's done a lot of work. I remember doing a production of the senior group to advise and to teach healthcare workers on what to do and what to do. She's done a lot of studies and she's supporting ICANN. She's supporting ICANN to do what they do. I will leave her to talk on her subject matter as well as tell us a bit about ICANN. 
Over to you, Anna. You are welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Zwanda, and thank you very much, everybody. Um, I've met some of you when I was there in, in February and even last year um, as well, and I was there in, in 2019 in Abuja. I just want to say I'm very privileged to be here and thank you for the invitation. If you're going to allow me, I'm going to switch off my video. We are at the moment in load shedding as well, so it has helped with the bandwidth. Um, and I'm going to just tell you a little bit about ICANN for you who don't know anything about ICANN. And then I'll give you a little bit of an overview on environmental cleaning, especially in our healthy facilities. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen with you. So I hope all of you can see my screen. If you can just indicate to me that you can see it. Yes. Thank you. Okay, as Dr. Zawande said, I'm the executive manager of ICANN, but I'm a nurse by background and I'm passionate about eye um, infection control. I've been in infection control for more than 20 years. I've been with ICANN since 2015. And I know Dr. Zawande because she was our treasurer when I joined ICANN as well. So uh, we've already come a long way and um, we work quite closely with the Nigerian society. So what we are actually uh, wanting to just show you guys a little bit about um, ICANN is that we want to also, especially as you mentioned, WASH, that um, infection control and WASH has always have to go hand in hand. Why do we um, say that? And then what is the purpose of environmental cleaning? We want to explain about the risk of contaminated environment and also then just the key elements of routine cleaning. And I think our next speaker will go into more detail about that. So I'm not going to touch on any of that. I'm just going to give an overview. Um, but just about ICANN, we've started in 2008 and um, Dr. Zwane was one of the founder members, but Prof Meta started it. And then in 2012, and they've actually registered here in South Africa as a non-for-profit. And we've been working as, as you can see all across Africa and um, our target is Cape to Cairo. But since 2015, when I joined, we actually kept track of um, our amount of members that we have. And we have 2018 currently at the moment. So what our vision was is to make sure that we have safe patient care throughout all our facility with strong evidence-based infection control programs. So what ICANN is actually then doing is by working with different countries, um, we want to promote and facilitate the facilitation of infection control programs, help making sure that we reduce infection rates across our healthcare facilities from tertiary right down to our primary healthcare facilities. We want to promote antimicrobial stewardship and we want to ensure that they've got national infection control structures in Africa, which we know was quite a big problem um, for many years. And it's only starting to really change over the last few years. So what we want to do is we want to just bring people together and we take into consideration WHO core comp competencies for infection con prevention and control professionals. And we want to make sure that we build capacity. We don't want to just work from here, but we want to uh, build up people across the Africa continent that they can actually then cascade the training down to the rest of all the healthcare workers that they get into contact with. And not just healthcare workers, uh, meaning nursing staff, but doctors, laboratory workers, our environmental health professionals, our cleaners, our maintenance people, um, even our visitors. So what we want to do is make sure that we use best practices. And as we know in Africa, Nana, we've traveled a lot of, in Africa, we know that in Africa, uh, resources is not always that easy. So we want to make sure that we make it possible for people to use whatever they've got to make it um, possible in their situation. So what we want to do is here, I just want to show some of our activities Big thing is in advocacy for IPC in healthcare to create a career path for nursing. And I know that in Nigeria, they're really at the moment busy with the certification course and also the Orange Network and also the mentorship for um, the professionals uh, to really establish that. We work quite closely with WHO Afro, WHO CDC, Africa CDC, Nigeria CDC, African Union, and you can see all of them there, and this will be available to, for all of you to, to see. Um, and when we spoke about the infection control societies, 
what we this, um, thought is that it will help if we can help countries to develop their own national society so they can then cascade it further down through their members in their country because they understand their own country's content, they understand their own country's culture, the background, and exactly how to adapt to adopt, making sure that they can put best practices in place. And you will see that Nigeria is one of the first ones that was actually established as well. And uh, the newest one is the Ethiopian uh, Infection Prevention Control Society that we launched in February when I was there after I visited uh, Lagos. And then we're busy with Madagascar and also with uh, DRC um, that they're also going to start using ECHO as you guys are using. Um, so we want to make sure that people we roll through and making sure people understand how they can use the ECHO platform to also, even in the furthest corners um, of their countries, they can build the capacity on IPC. And we know that IPC is, is something that we need to realize that with the technology changing, with people moving a lot uh, more across borders than before, um, as we saw over the last two years with the pandemic, how quickly it spread and how, how we saw with um, the monkeypox and also now in Europe that you guys uh, actually are quite experts in. And I've listened to quite a few presentations that people from the Western Africa have done on that, that people can learn from us. So what we are also aiming is to set up an uh, ICANN hub or like a small ICANN office and Nigeria has already set up the, uh, the Western hub that they are actually working from. And what we want to do is to make sure that all the countries that are in the Western Africa region will then all take hands and work together and actually expand this further into the rest of Africa. So this is what we want to do. And we also want to ensure that we include our French, our Portuguese and our Arabic speaking um, countries. And that's why when we do our webinars, we actually make sure that we do have interpretation into Portuguese and Arabic um, because a lot of them really want to learn and want to, they can really share a lot of experiences with us as well. Um, I think the, for me, the biggest thing is that we really need to look at every country because we can learn and we can um, find out how they do it differently than us and we can actually link our problems um, and find solutions through other countries what they are actually doing at the moment. So when we now look at environmental cleaning, where does it fit in our healthcare facilities? And I know a lot of people talk about um, disinfecting and we are really um, so focused on using chlorine and fogging and spraying. And, and we've seen that over the last two years that we really want to make sure that people need to understand that cleaning first and then disinfecting is very um, important. That routine cleaning in our healthcare facilities doesn't mean that we need to routinely disinfect everything. Um, and just this morning, we had a workshop with Gamma Health and uh, Mr. First Aid, um, and they actually set up a nice uh, isolation room that you can set up within a few minutes, four minutes, you have a, a room the size for enough for uh, isolation room. Um, and it's the, the, the sheet that they use is completely disposable um, and there's no contamination and you really can help your patients. And especially as we've seen during the pandemic, how crucial that was when we wanted to triage and wanted to isolate patients. So we want to make sure that people follow best practices when we clean. Uh, we want to make sure that people use the correct um, PPE as well. So what we do is environmental cleaning falls within our standard precautions. And standard precautions, we always say, is something that you do every day with every patient in every situation, even at home. So environmental cleaning is one of the core components of standard precautions. And that is something that we do every time. When we move over to transmission-based precautions and we think about the, the different type of diseases when we know what is happening there, then we add on. But originally we start with just normal cleaning and making sure we have a safe environment for our patients. And because of that, we need to look at definitions because a lot of people get confused about definitions and what is cleaning and what is disinfecting. 
And very important is that cleaning is by physically removing soil, organic material, chemical deposits from a surface or an object. And we need to make sure that, remember, this is um, in our environment, uh, the patient's bedside, the patient's bed, the bell, the window, the curtains around the patient's bed, the monitor, the bedside table, the overbed locker, um, everything that the patient touches when they go to the bathroom, the door handles, everything in our facilities. And then you need to first clean there. You can't start immediately with your disinfectant and think, now because I've used chlorine all over, it's, everything is clean. Um, disinfectant gets deactivated when it comes into contact with organic material. So that's why we have to first clean. And there's a lot of products on the market that um, claims to do both. Um, and just this morning, we had a, a very good discussion on that. And we need to look at studies, how we can actually save time by uh, looking at combining it. But that is for uh, something else. A very important thing that we need to also realize, and you'll see on this picture, it says that over 50% of our beds and mattresses are contaminated with MRSA. And now that we've got COVID, we totally forgot about MRSA and we don't even talk about it. We just think, oh, you know, MRSA is not even there. We just all focus now on COVID and everybody is so worried. And we just want to put on masks and every PPE that we can think about. But we need to just realize that we need to do a risk assessment. And the same as when we do cleaning. So when we look at disinfecting, it means that you want to kill or inactivate microorganisms except for our spores, which can only be clean, um, destroyed when we um, sterilize them, uh, on inanimated surfaces, that means on objects. If you want to clean your hands, you're not disinfecting your hands, you are sanitizing your hands. So we need to make sure that we realize and understand, um, and we have a lot of those problems, especially here in South Africa, where people tend to use the alcohol hand rub and spray the bedside tables and want to clean it with that. Whereas it then leaves a little emollient level onto the bedside tables and that can actually create a lot of contamination. So we want to make sure that people understand environmental disinfection is most often achieved by using a chemical after you've cleaned. And we want to make sure that when we use the chemical, we use a chemical that is suitable for our environment, that won't damage your materials, your bedsides, or your trolleys, or the tables, or the floors, or the windows, or the curtains, or whatever you want to clean. So when we think about this, we want to think about the why do we clean? Because if something looks clean, it gives people more confidence that they are getting good quality care in this environment. If it's dirty, if there's dust on the floor and papers lying around, people are not really going to feel like they want to come into your facility. So we want to make sure that they feel confident that this is a safe place. We want to also make sure that we reduce the contamination of possible healthcare associated pathogens or organisms that are around that people maybe didn't clean their hands, touch all over. Um, and if we don't clean regularly, that can be leading to another um, contamination of another patient or they take it home and they get sick at home. It's also part of removing all the different substances, the moisture, the dirt, organic material, whatever you can think about. And if you look at the bottom picture, that mop that they're using, I don't know if you're still using spaghetti mops, but I hate spaghetti mops. And these fiber optic material that they use with these mops are so much better because you don't need to lift the mop, you actually move it around and it all the uh, dust and all the organic material sits onto this um, flat surfaces. It's uh, detachable, you can wash it in the in your uh, washing machine and then you can also then color code it as well. So for that, um, it's so much easier to use that than if, than if you have your uh, different buckets that you want to use with your clean and your dirty water. And just today, um, I actually wrote it down. I want to go and get the paper. They actually said they've done a study to show that reusing the water um, that we are doing at the moment when we're cleaning our environment in our healthcare facility actually get contaminated so quickly um, that it's uh, after about three or four times, not even 
user friendly to use on our floors. So we want to just think about that. So then if we look at the healthcare facility and you look at this picture, you can see all these little arrows that shows it's not or even all, that's all the areas where we touch. And this is where it's part of cleaning our environment. It's a patient's environment. It's where the visitors or the doctors or the nurses or the healthcare workers, anybody that's around the patient, the people from the laboratory come and collect blood or the phys uh, physiotherapist that's helping the patient, Everybody is going to be around in this area, and this is where we need to clean on a regular basis. And then just um, contamination. We sometimes don't even know where the contamination is. And we know that there's a video, and the people that actually have done some of the courses that we do, uh, we do have, we call it a blue movie. And it's not a blue movie like people normally think a blue movie, but it, it actually shows you how everything turns blue um, just to show the contamination as we touch it without seeing it. Because remember, we can't see the germs. It looks clean, but it might not be clean. And this just shows us that it could be anywhere. And if we understand how long organisms survive on surfaces, some of them even survive for months or years, if it's not cleaned properly, um, then that's one of the reasons why we want to make sure that there's a plan and a strategic way of cleaning and that we clean from a certain area as well. The risk of contamination, as we said, body fluids, um, the way we keep on touching, and here I've uh, put in a picture of the monkeypox as well. And we know that you know if uh, the it opens up the fluid, that can be contaminated. Um, it is normally with contact, whereas with COVID, when we know COVID was more droplet and an airborne, we can do an able uh, aerosol generating procedure, but also then the contact, if you get in close contact with somebody that you want to protect that, um, the surfaces around, and the same as, as we think about TB, when people are exposed to somebody that has TB and you don't even know about it, that it stays in the air for quite a long time, then slowly drop to the surfaces. And then when you touch and it's not being cleaned properly, then you'll have a, a problem there. So what we want to make sure is that people understand how to do that. And this is just a one picture. And the pilot has been done there in Lagos with Dr. Dami um, that we developed, I can develop with um, CDC, the environmental cleaning uh, toolkit. And we've got very good results. And I know, I'm sure you've already shared it as well. They've done a beautiful video that they've shown to me. And it's so amazing when I was there on cleaning that I think that is something that we have to show everywhere. And we follow the, the guidelines from WHO and CDC how to clean and where to start. So we want to break the chain of infections. And I'm not going to go into detail with that. It's just to see that we know that there is a chain and how do we break that we want to remove one of those um, organisms so we want to make sure that when there's an infectious agent that if the environment is clean we will prevent that agent from going to the host okay it can be direct or indirect and we've uh, spoke a lot about this already hands um, nasal and your throat droplet and, and an airborne and then indirect is where we touch our drip stands the disinfection uh, equipment. Sometimes we forget where we touch. The mops in the buckets, the handle of the mops. How often do we clean that? And then you can see our staff. We must remember, and that is why hand hygiene is so important. Our hands are the most way of contaminating and spreading the disease. But if you can look at all of these pictures, it shows you all the areas where they frequently touch and where it can lead to contamination. So this was about uh, for COVID and we spoke about environmental cleaning is more important than disinfecting. Depends on which area you are, or if you're in a high risk area in the ICU or in the area where the people are really susceptible, then you will do the disinfecting as well. And one thing I always say is about, we are so worried about clean floors that we disinfect our floors because we think we are eating or treating our patients off the floors. Um, if we do, and sometimes it does happen, sorry, somebody's got, um, sometimes in some of our areas, we do treat our patients on the floor, then we will clean and disinfect the floors. But if you have patients on beds, why are we so worried about the floors? We keep on cleaning the floors, but we forget about the environment around the patient. 
Um, and then just one thing is we have to have a, a regular cleaning routine. Uh, they need to be a standard out to clean, a fixed routine when they need to go into clean with a checklist, and then to monitor going back afterwards to see are they doing it properly and how are they doing it. And there's just the cleaning standards that we need to look at, making sure that everything is clean and dry before we move the next patient in, making sure that the chemicals we use are up to standards for our equipment, that it doesn't damage our equipment, that we know how to clean up after spills, uh, look after our equipment that we are using to clean as well. And you will see that this lady, the mop that she's using, the handle is also aluminum and not wood, because we know that wood is more porous and the wood will keep on the organisms and it's difficult to clean a handle if it's from wood. So we tend to move away from wood. And then just the final one that I want to say is about training. And this is why you also have this ECHO platform where we can keep on training people about different things in our infection control. Um, if people understand how it works, how to do it, then they can do it properly. But if they never had training, we can't expect them to understand what we are saying to them if we don't explain to them what is happening. And that is the final one from me. I don't know if there's any questions or if you take the questions afterwards. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Zawande. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Anna. Uh, I'm sure that's a big thing you've done very well. You've given us a lot of you. And I'm sure people have not seen their comments and their contributions that we have at the end. So please, Anna, please stay on for us to have the second presentation so that we can take it all together. Our next presenter is none other than our own Dr. Chioma Oswald. Uh, she's an IPC specialist medical doctor by profession, uh, a microbiologist, a consultant microbiologist at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital uh, slash the College of Medicine University of Lagos. She has gone through all the courses apart from her, uh, her, her qualification, she went through the specialized courses basic, intermediate, and advanced course. So she has an additional diploma like So we want to hear from the experts, and she's going to take us through the next presentation, which is more facility-based, like we have said. So I give to you Dr. Chioma Oswag. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking on applicable best practices in uh, environmental contamination. And as a, an introduction, the environment acts as a piece of work for various agents, and some of them may be multi drug resistant or difficult to treat. And the contamination breaks the chain of transmission. And decreases special sensing and also quality of care. So it should be structured in a way that it should be effective. So that's the chain of health infection. And the, and the contamination breaks that is important from the environment to the patient. So environmental contamination is actually, like I said, removing microbes from the environment. And it's a, Combination of two processes, cleaning and disinfection. You can't disinfect the dirty environment, and your the contamination disinfection will not be effective if there are protonation substances, organic materials, or deaths. They will deactivate whatever chemical you're using for your disinfection, so your contamination will be effective. And for the contamination of the environment to be effective, it has to have some structures, organizational staffing, training, infrastructure, supplies, procedures, monitoring, and feedback. And also, what you do if you don't monitor and you don't give feedback, you may not know if you're doing well or not. So, for us to do a good environmental cleaning, we need administrative support. So, our medical directors should 
know what we are doing, we should give us the support, then there should be somebody who is responsible, a focal person or any manager or we also the pressure control and uh, loss or uh, anybody that is appointed and we be given a part time or full time to be responsible for the cleaning. And that person will be responsible for everything about the cleaning, the um, SOP, the SOPs, the policies, the uh, data budgeting and everything. And we will be uh, responsible for communicating with all that parts of the facility, other departments about what is going to be used for cleaning and the contamination. So if they can, if there's administrative support, then there will be projects and framework for communication and for, uh, collaboration with other sectors will have to be implemented. So what do we need for preventing uh, contamination? We need to wash facilities. Without wash facilities, we can't do anything. We have no water, no uh, sanitation, no hygiene, we can't do the uh, contamination. So we need clean water uh, and enough quantity to enable us to do so. Those are the things the facility will put in place to make for best practices. Of so we need the cleaning tools, we need the external protective equipment, we need the uh, supplies, and we also need supply management. So um, who is uh, taking the inventory? Who is, where are we getting it from? What is the stock? All those things we need to be recorded. So we need our records. And we also need the appropriate services for good cleaning. So you cannot um, put your tables to gather food that are porous and they are them like you expect a better contamination. So after the um, FPC person or the uh, cleaning focal person should uh, be bought when the hospital wants to purchase space for the facility so that she will make recommendations for the kind of things that are easy to clean. And for the hospital, for the facility to get there. And the, there should also be appropriate staffing and training. So, we, the different levels of staff, from the cleaners to their supervisors, and they should be trained appropriately depending on their level of interest. So, they may not be used for training to depend on the, the level of interest. And they should have basic knowledge in hospital acquired infection, how it is transmitted. So this will help them to um, have an idea or visualize what they are doing. Because if they don't have an idea what they are doing, they will not be able to give So if they know that there are all musics on the surfaces that are cleaning, and those all music they will have to them, and everybody around them, they will be able to do their own better. Then they should also be giving basic training on cleaning. And disinfection and types types of disinfectants and why they should get their PPEs and the appropriate PPEs to use. Then there should be a standard of quality procedure for different staff involved in the cleaning to follow, and there should be cleaning law so that appropriate records should be taken. Um, and the staff will be trained based on. The SOP and their uh, job description. So the surfaces in the environment, in the hospital environment, should be easy to clean, easy to maintain and repair. They should not have some uh, um, things that will make organisms with uh, low particular, like um, cloth material, cotton materials that absorb moisture, will encourage organisms to grow. And they should not be, uh, be not porous so that obviously they don't see people and come out after the cleaning and they should be seamless. So the, the, the facilities should, or uh, the person in charge of cleaning should make sure that whatever the facilities get are things that are easy for them to handle. Then there should be written policies and procedures that are documented and officially approved by the facility. And they should uh, do that of the people who the cleaners report to and who the supervisors report to. What should be the form of a diagram so that they know what to do at each time? If there is no bleach, who do they report to? If the bleach is not the recommended type, what should they do? So there should be those policies. Then there should be still a schedule for every part of the facility. Um, if it's 
the the data world. How many times should we be clean? Which part of the place should be? How we should we be cleaned? So there should also be training, um, policy on training. How many times? What are we training each staff for? And how many times are we training? And when are we training? I want uh, the information we are going to give that person should be documented. Then there should be list of a book supplies so that nobody will just go to market and buy just anything and think that it may not be effective. So there should be a food supplies, the ones that have been tested and tried and found to be effective, they should be documented. And if there's any reason to change them, maybe they are now out of stock, they should also be um, the procedure to it and the approval should be everybody should know about it. Then there should be approved PPE for each procedure. If you are going to uh, mix your uh, hypochlorite, what are you going to do? Then there should be SOPs for every procedure in the cleaning and the contamination, starting from the um, list of things we use to how to monitor the effectiveness of the clean. So in that, there should be a cleaning checklist, job books, job base, and things for to make the cleaning more effective. Right. So we should be able to monitor um, what we are cleaning. And the monitor, the monitor will check this. But if you did, you can do the direct observation. And when you did the direct observation, we use a checklist. So, so the, we can monitor by direct observation using a checklist. And we observe with the super, we can observe the patient and the illness. Why they are clean and this will be done then. So we use the cleaning checklist, we do the cleaning logs. Then we can do visual assessment of the cleanliness. Is this tasty or not? We can use fluorescent markers to check. Maybe before they start cleaning, we can secretly mark some places and then the cleaning should check. If they are fluorescent, you know that they didn't clean it well. And if um, that's a fluorescent marker, before we use another so give the feedback. Okay, let me go. So you give the feedback. So you can give direct feedback immediately. You finish um, supervising, call the cleaners and give them direct feedback. Tell them what they did well and what they did too well, ask them for their challenges, let them be helpful, listen to them, so that we'll be able to um, do on the job training for them, then they went through. And also uh, record your meeting with the, what you noticed for that day, and you use it for the next meeting, so that we will be able to check. This thing that we could do well today, we will do well done, and we we'll also use um, the feedback, from the patients and the, uh, the observation group, and you're not taking back to management and stakeholders so that there will be uh, music for continuous improvement of the facility. And you can now organize, there should be organized yearly or um, quarterly or two yearly audits of the uh, environmental decontamination to see. If there are gaps where you can improve and things that are not going well and that things that can be uh, enhanced. So in the um, in the cleaning and then the contamination, we should realize that there cannot be effective decontamination without first cleaning. We cannot disinfect a dating place. And we should use standard uh, approved. Uh, disinfectants or uh, disinfectant, and we should not mix soap and detergent, and we should make sure that we follow manufacturer's instruction for the surfaces we are cleaning. The things that we normally use hypochlorite a lot in our resource limited area, but we should realize that some 
surfaces are um, hypochlorite sensitive. So those surfaces may either follow the manufacturer's instruction or we use a ethanol, 70% ethanol to clean it if they are not ethanol sensitive. So or whatever we do, there should be appropriate documentation and feedback. And we should also let the management know what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Swag. So now um, we want feedback, questions, comments, comments from participants. If you want to talk, can you just raise your hand? Go to the reaction, just click on it, put up your hand so that we can call you to talk. Either you have a uh, contribution, comment, or questions, or share your experience. Um, when we have the background, but I'm sure we're all involved in it because we all work in hospitals. So we have. And we have your hands up. Anybody, can you just put up your hand and your experience? This last presentation or Dr. Swag's presentation. There are two presentations today. Uh, somebody. Sorry, Dr. Zawanda, it's Anna here from ICANN. I saw in the chat box that the one person were asking about what is the major obstacle in Nigeria. And it will be good if people can maybe share that um, with the team here. Uh, what they found in maybe in their facilities, what is the major obstacle? Because then, you know, maybe it could be a discussion that we could talk about. Maybe I'll say for cleaning or uh, decontamination, we need to be specific. Is it cleaning? Uh, who is asking? Who is that? That's uh, Shikade. Do you do you do you have anything in mind? Shikade? Are you talking Staff about to know. Staff to know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So what I'm asking is, since it has been established that uh, it will help in reducing HA highs. So I'm looking at what can be the obstacle in achieving effective environmental cleaning, because the major goal of IPC is to reduce HAI. So I'm looking at it from the angle of what can be the, the possible uh, obstacle that needs to be overcome to us to achieve effective environmental cleaning in our own setting here in Nigeria. Okay, and maybe PAC Okay, that's what we are discussing. Yeah. Okay, in um, yes, in, uh, in Nigeria, we have different levels of uh, healthcare facilities. So, but one, um, one thing that comes across is the uh, resistance to change. They want to do Sorry, Dr. Zwanda, I think, um, I don't know if it's just on my side, but there was just um, nothing cut off while well, they were still talking. You are still muted.
Sorry, Dr. Zwanda, you are still muted, so we can't hear you. Hi, Hannah. Sorry, I think sorry, I'm sorry, I think I was muted. No, it's there. I, what I'm saying is uh, Dr. Swag is discussing where everyone else can chip in. We are discussing when we have challenges, either with the cleaning or the, the contamination, when we have challenges, what experience do we have in going around the challenges so that we can all learn from ourselves? So Dr. Oswagu was still talking. Have you finished? That one is disconnected. Maybe I'm using this. Maybe I'm using this. Let's just go. 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 Hello. Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. I can hear you. Okay. So, in addition to resistance to change or learning new things, we also have the uh, challenge of uh, supplies. So sometimes we don't have enough supplies to and um, enough staff to be able to do effective things. Then also administrative support may not be encouraged. Um, there's something in the chat box, uh, Dr. Hachi, is saying that the obstacles are the lack of those factors. Some headings, Dr. Chairman, we said in that presentation. Somebody is talking about So maybe we look at that, and then you know, when we list them, I think it would be useful for us to know how we go around this challenge. But that's the that's the beauty of public health, not just listening it out. People who have experiences of when they have this, so can you like them or can you go back to that? What should we say? So that will work for them. Okay, that's that's and so that you know, is that what you're talking about? Is it this one, Dr. Kachi? Can you talk, Dr. Kachi? Yes, I can talk. Yes, yes. So when we look at, uh, sorry, I have a cracked voice. So in your presentation, I love the way you presented this. And so when she said obstacles, I saw it from that angle. When we don't have all these things, these are the major obstacles. They can, they can form obstacles to um, effective um, cleaning or the contamination. So that's how I, so that's, that's a, my own contribution to the presentation. So why do we solve? Talk about something that really wants to do. Yeah. That's what I want to say about attitudes. This is time to change. What have you done in your own facilities? Who will come back and go back and forth? Over to you. Are you asking me, bro? Are you asking me? Yeah, no, 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 no,
So um, right at the moment, we are trying to make sure that we have um, policies um, around cleaning, environmental cleaning. Um, so that is one thing we are doing at the moment. It's um, on a draft um, stage and we have given it to the management. Um, um, I've actually, because I'm, I'm going to, my work is quite detailed to the extent that we want to actually check, um, you know, to measure the, um, you know, the, what do you call it, the, the cleaning, we want to do the effective cleaning, teach clean, um, effective cleaning, and also measure um, the bio body, you know, in of cleaning practices in at the point of care. So, at the first, I just said it would be nice to have a policy around cleaning. Since you have some other policies that we have made as a the IPC uh, team, so what we've done so far is just to get a draft of the of the. Um, clean policies um basically that it's any other thing it's still work in progress um for so far from my own staffing when it comes to staffing um i it's when i could start the work i would not know whether we have enough staff you know training will also be part of it but so far it's just a policy that we just have been able to work on thank you the number of staff that you need for each particular area of your facility. Some areas don't need too many staff, like they are two blocks and rest of them. Those are the cleaning and the first thing. Because they need to have these areas like some focus and other ones. One training for the staff and they need more staff so that the the people cleaning the next area may be different from the so that you don't get anything missed up. But do you have organizational support for what you're doing? Because everything you're planning, you don't have support, so you won't be able to achieve them. So I've never had focusing this into your entity. Is it support? Um, I think we don't need to make it too personal to go to the church <laughs> because there are other participants that they want to contribute. Uh, this is, um, well, from my own view, the framework for best practices, where we look at the challenges, but for us to have best practices is to ensure that we have one, two, three, four, five in place. Attitude, attitude will not just change the product. It's something you need to, when you keep monitoring, giving feedback, you reward good work, you know, like you have a best word or something to everybody is trying to work to attain the best practice. I think it's better to look at it from that uh, point of view. Attitude is a big thing, but then the overall change can be achieved. And I'm sure some facilities will move to because when, this is where we started from now. This is where we are. We went visiting uh, some two, three weeks ago, and we were amazed that the staff were very cautious and people said, oh, are these people Nigerians? But well, you know, it's all part of the leadership. And I think the way we start looking at behavioral change is something we should start working on as we are planning. It's not just cleaning, it's ordinary cleaning and the contamination, but then that must be that psychological part. We need to massage people's ego, you know, to get the best out of them. You know, from the best out of staff, you must massage the ego and know how to handle them and you give you the best. I don't think anybody has anything to say. Um, anybody has anything to just say about that? But I think, you know, looking at that slide, best practices, yes, we have it theoretically, but to do it practically is a huge, huge, big job. Uh, but we must remember that for us to get it, number one, we must have a plan, we must have monitoring, and then people, people don't do what you expect them to do. They do only things that you expect, and you, you know you encourage them when they do well. When they don't do well, you don't reprimand them at all. You know there is a way you massage their ego. Oh, do you know you could have done it this way? They may even know you because many at times they know it, but because something happened, they just did it the wrong way. Just encourage them. 
then we may start talking about it. So I don't know if anybody has anything to add to that. Anna. Yes, so I just I just want to add in what you are saying. Uh, I mean, uh, it's everywhere that we see that, um, uh, especially with our cleaners or our um, assistants who's doing that, we need to show them how important their role in infection prevention and control is. If they understand that they are actually key, they are not just there. Um, that if they don't clean properly, it can lead to so much more. And if we can help them to understand that. And when I was there, we did that um, testing with the fluorescent fluid. And I've done that across, and it really helps for people to see that we, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And then as we build up their confidence, they actually then realize that, you know, they are key in the role that we all play in infection control. It's not just the nurses or the doctors. The cleaners are just as important as anybody else because without them, we can't do the rest. We need them. So they need to understand how valuable they are. And that's why we need to really build on them. And then also, um, you know, behavior change, we all talk about behavior change, but um, we need to be the leaders of that behavior change because it's no use me telling them to do one thing and we don't follow that. We need to show them. People look at what we are saying and what we are doing and they pick up when we don't do what we say. Um, and also to change behavior, you need to start doing something for at least 21 days, every single day the same way for it to become a habit and part of your beha daily behavior. Otherwise people won't do it. And if we use this, the stick, like we call it, uh, if you just um, shout at people and tell them that they're wrong, then people don't listen, they shut off. We need to try and show to them that, you know, we're so grateful for what you've done, but let's just make it a little bit easier for you, but also best practice. Just because you don't have running water doesn't mean that you can't clean. Let's show you how to use the best possible way with the limited resources that you have until we can get to a step where we can have all the resources. Thank you, that's all just for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ben, for that contribution. And um, it's making them number one, making them feel important. That's all about you know, dealing with adults. You know, you don't tell them, do, you don't rubbish, and you don't get the best out of them. Make them important that in the health system delivery, you are the most important. Because if you don't get it right, no matter what the nurse does, no matter what the doctors do, you know, it will ruin everything, and then you feel important and you get the most out of them. Any other contributions, comments? That was very good, Shike. Thank you. Oh, but one more thing, one more thing. Uh, there is a uh, staff turnover, and I want to have experience from the field on outsourcing cleaning, because there are some places where they are source cleaning. How do you handle, you know, staff that are outsourced? You know, we're talking about staffing and training. We want to have a experience, but that could be another challenge. Does anybody have any um, comments on that? Staff turnover, remember they are low data staff, and because they are not, I don't want to say what it is, uh, they will not get paid. I, I have one experience, uh, one of the PACs, because it's a political class that pays the salary. And uh, the lady that I was in and political class, they did not employ another cleaner in town. She had to come back and offer you know, her services. So I go. Uh, how do you give you what you want in your facility to ensure that we prevent infection and possible acquire infections? Our contribution. Uh,
outsourced, and now we are seeing that it's lack of the education. They don't have to be educated to you. You may have to go to the employers. So, how do you think we can handle this? Because we need to brainstorm to see how we solve this problem. But that's the practicability of what we see to ensure that we have this best practice. Any comments? You can put your, your hand and talk. Any comment? Anybody that's had that situation and you handle it well and you have the best at all. Any facilities where your cleaners are outsourced and you've been able to manage it? Somebody said but they may not really be uh, dedicated to you. How do you make sure you get the cleaners? Cleaners that will be dedicated. Does anybody have any idea? Or oh, we don't have that because we cannot just let them send us anybody. But that is not straight. Whereas you, you know, we, we want to still prevent infection because I know that out there, some people are sourced. I saw that in Abuja. You know, Abuja they have sourced the cleaning because uh, someone nobody wants to think on that again. But then for us as the IPC practitioners, whether they are sourced or employed, we want to make sure we get the best. So how has does anybody have any experience? Or do we just need it? Somebody says it's the same challenge in my facilities. Let's discuss how do we think we can, it, it may not be something we solve overnight, but we're just being down to earth. We want to make sure we can think through it. Can I Hello? just ask, Dr. Zawanda? Yes. I just want yes. to mention we had the same problem in South Africa. And most of our facilities have outsourced cleaning now. So what we've actually then done is um, we actually uh, set up a contract or a service level of agreement with the company that does the cleaning. And part of that is that we want to see their training material that they use on their cleaners before they send them to us. And that we do then do spot checks or that their cleaners must be trained by us. Um, so that was one of the reasons, but it took a very long time. I mean, it took a few years for us to really get it right. And still up until today, we still struggle with that because they do have a, a quick turnaround and they don't pay the people a high um, salary. So people leave very easily um, and then you have new staff, so you have to start all over again. But um, if you do have that where we have a um, sort of like a supervisor uh, in the cleaning part where they then take it onto them when there's a new person to sort of take them under their wing and show them the right ways. Just make sure that they do have it the right ways because if you show people the wrong thing, it's very difficult to unlearn a wrong action. But um, that really helped. Um, it's still a process because it's still not uh, 100%, but it really helped us to, to put that into the contract that we had in with the company that brought in the outsource cleaning staff. Thank you. So thank you very much, Anna. It means that in our advocacy to management, uh, as an IPC committee, the chairman must make sure that when you are going to outsource either they will make the IPC committee train the staff they're going to send, or if they are going to do it themselves, we want to make sure some, somebody supervises that training, and it's not just a training, or you have a new entrance package, which is you know, your policy you have that before you can start cleaning, then you can do this. So it's be part of the MOU that is signed with that company. So that's, that's one way. Yeah, um, Chama, yes, Chama, yeah. Okay. In Lutz, we had a, a cleaning toolkit project where we trained cleaners in the natural world. Only to turn and see that all those cleaners had gone and they have replaced them with a uh, source cleaners. So, infection rates started rising and failed. I was just passing one, I saw one cleaner using her bare hands to transfer um, deaths. From a dustbin to another bag, and she was trying to recycle that bag that she was removing. So we have to call her and talk to her. 
But that's what we're going to say. We, Professor Gunshala and the IPC is going to manage to talk to them and so that they can allow us to have access to the uh, contract cleaners. Because when the uh, nurses don't have access to the contract, they prospect to their contractors and they do not have any uh, business with the healthcare workers. And if you talk to them, they say, no, this is how we are going to do it. So we now have a we are in the process of getting an arrangement where we will train them and those that are not trained by us can all work with us so that they know what we want and we do it the way we want. It's still a process we have not yet achieved it. It's a recent thing, it's still ongoing. So it's, um, it's a process and uh, I can see uh, Dr. John again, he said, Advocacy with the hospital management is key. If you get them to see it from your own point of view, and IPC is in the form, they will ensure that when that is being done, they report it. So that they involve you, they put it in the contract. So that's one way, but you know, it's a, it's a process. Uh, receive brainstorming, and they will get there, and they will be together, because that is the only thing now. Everybody is trying to our source, and they don't need you. Tell the IPC team that we are going to assess that you didn't even know you just talked about it. But having interaction with the management, uh, you will be able to know when they are about to change. The, 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 it means the, the interaction has to be close. For somebody to at least tell you that if you want to ask us or change the staff, let us know what we need to change. So we need to be more on ground. We need to put our foot down that we need to be involved. Because the cleaners are very, very key on this discussion we had uh, this afternoon. I don't know if there's any other, I think that is key. We are going to go on to something that we we'll keep back to talk about this outsourcing and turn over our staff. Uh, Anna just told us that they have the same, uh, not challenge, not a problem, in South Africa, but it's evolving, and then together we wait for to see how we solve the problem today. Any other questions, query, comments? Uh, please note that the uh, feedback uh, link is in the chat box. As we are talking, can you please make sure you click on it and uh, give us your feedback so that we can go back and use it to improve and uh, plan the future sessions. So, for me, while as we're doing that, any other thing, any other hot, hot questions or comments? And of course, somebody has said, apart from the advocacy base, supporting supervision has to be, you know, like she said, you don't let them know where you're going to do it, <laughs> you know, and then you, know, you praise them when they do well, and when they have done too well, send them, look, you know, you've done this very well. Try to massage them, you tell them something positive first. And then, but you know, this one, you have done it better than this one. So, the next time, they do better. And if you go back and you notice that they've done it the way it's supposed to be done, they do. Um, give them the, the, the courage. So, any other thing? Any other comments? As we are thanking you for joining, but we need your, your reaction, your feedback. And somebody said, Thomas, um, I can't say the story, says we can achieve their problem, we can we can make them perform. Exactly. Uh, what is the best killing stuff? That's another way, like I said, you know, I don't like that. The best killing stuff, maybe people will put the picture at the entrance to the ward so that the next cleaner wants to achieve that so that we can encourage them. There are ways of massaging people that people can get They are located that stuff, but they're very, very key. They're very, very key. And she said, when they changed the infection rates, went up and it was like the biologist and I want to go for it up. We start investigating. So, anything we can do to get them to give us their best. 
Newton. So any other comments? I think it's a very good. I want to thank the two presenters. They have really opened uh, uh, the awakening us to think more. It's not just what we need to control the infection, but what we supposed to do. And when we talk about cleaners, don't let us forget that we have company that can do this. Have drivers that try to handle themselves. Have the attendants that move things around, that we say the around the world. They need to be part of this training. They need to know that they are important in controlling the infection. It's not just epidemics. Now we are trying to institutionalize virus, and that's the thing. So that whenever they uh, we pray that we don't make it okay, but we get this one of the forms. But we, we also want, we want to spread the system. And part of the best system spreading is getting our training staff, not just trained, but doing it right. Uh, and I think that's the thing to happen. We may not be able to do the whole lesson at the same time. Like I know you started from the data world, and the subsequent it is spread. So uh, if there's a will, there's always a way, and always be done. And once for it means it's not that like that change should not, not just be once. It can be maybe every three months to do the pressure course, or when they have new staff to go back and make sure you know, they do it right and they do some of the solution as well. Just be plenty. Please feel the feedback um, as we round up. I'm sorry that uh, the spot lines for the University of Maine not come on today. We hope the next one be able to have a customer uh, come and show us how they've been able to deal with their cleaning staff and how what they've been able to change. Since the form of the IBC course. Once we did not have any case presentation, I'm just saying that yes, because I yes. Yeah, she said what is that? That's it. Because at the last uh she down the show. Right? Yeah, no, no, it's the it's the spotlight for the university of the I mentioned it at the beginning that uh unfortunately. Come and see here. I saw
and uh, not that there's no recurrence, but we should remember we have monkeypox and they will always have lots of people with us so who will decide what we're going to do. But we can advise on what to do. But what is on our, our curriculum is required and S months. So on that note, has everybody done the feedback? Anybody that hasn't done it, can you please put up your hand so that we know that uh, you have all the feedback? Hello? Hello? Has everybody done the feedback? Uh, or last, do you want to say something? Yes, ma, I cannot, I can't do the feedback. When I'm trying to submit it, we erase everything and start me all over. I've been doing it more than seven times now. It's still repeating the same thing. There is a place that the answer needs no, that you need to type in. As soon as I type in, it will not allow me to go further. So I don't been able to do it and submit. It is just you. Well, for me, I'm having the same challenge. I can't submit. It keeps saying there we are some errors with your submission. Please correct them and submit again. And I don't know what to what else to do. Good afternoon. All. Can we, can we please try again, please? Can you try again? Um, so maybe um, it's a bit down, but you can try again. As we've had two or several people actually submit, I see that Dr. Jean says she's going to submit. I see that Chukun also funnily um, says he has or she has submitted. So please try again. You should be able to submit. Right, so there's a question requiring you. I'm just also trying to check it right here in my browser. The question is, do you have additional comments regarding your satisfaction with or lack of satisfaction with this telephone session? You can just say no if you have no comments, but if you have some comments, okay. you so can write it I have submitted mine now. Submitted. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for trying again. So please, um, if you are actually having the same issue, please try to do that. Thank you. Okay, on that note, I think uh, we've had a long day and I think uh, we've had some nice interaction. Uh, actually, when we started, it was many cats and dogs there. We were wondering whether it's going to affect the internet. So we thank those of you that have made time that have stayed this long. Thank you all very much. We hope we'll see you again next month. Next month, last Thursday, July 2022. Thank you. Thank you. I submitted through another link. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, everybody. And you too, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Thank you, Azir. Bye. <laughs> We thank our presenters and we thank everybody that's made time to attend. Thank you. Thank you.